Okay, welcome to the second video of four on the biological molecules. This video will cover the lipids, which is the biological term for fats. And like all four biological molecules, uh, lipids, just like carbohydrates, are going to be classified as organic. Uh, fats are special because while they are organic, uh, unlike carbohydrates, they're not going to be soluble in water. Uh, most carbohydrates, except for cellulose, is going to be soluble in water. Fats are definitely not soluble in water. So as a consequence, we classify them as nonpolar. Sometimes you may see the term hydrophobic. Both of those two, those two terms mean the same thing. Uh, those two terms mean that those molecules will not be able to dissolve in an aqueous environment. Um, lipids, in general, are going to store more energy than carbohydrates. While carbohydrates are the primary energy source for living organisms on planet Earth, uh, for the most part, they don't store a great deal of energy. Uh, lipids store a whole heck of a lot more. And fats in general are also going to be used to cushion those vital organs around every single one of your organs right now, no matter how uh, heavy or thin you may be. You have a layer of fats running your heart, your liver, your intestine, your lungs, so as to cushion the organs from any sort of impact. Uh, and of course, you have a thin layer of fat underneath your skin. That layer may be slightly, slightly larger if you're slightly heavier so as to protect you from excessive heat loss. Uh, when we look at the structure of the fat, what I want you to notice is that fats are composed of two different types of biological molecules. The first biological molecule is glycerol. It's really a three carbon alcohol with each of three hydroxyl groups. Okay? Uh, and the rest of the fat uh, will be composed of three fatty acid molecules. So a fat is typically one glycerol molecule and three fatty acid molecules. We're going to link those fatty acid molecules to the glycerol backbone using not what else but dehydration reactions. The dehydration reaction will take place between the carboxyl group of the fatty acid and the hydroxyl group of glycerol. Uh, a molecule of water will be produced as you'd expect in a dehydration reaction and a new chemical bond will form between those two molecules. Let's take a look at what that chemical bond looks like. The chemical bond that links a fatty acid to glycerol is called an ester. Uh, we've seen this functional group as part of the 10 functional groups that I'd like you to be familiar with uh, for this class. In general, an ester group is a C double bond O, O group. This O is usually going to be attached to a carbon atom, as will this carbon atom over here. It will also be attached to a carbon atom. Uh, what we create as a consequence is an ester linkage. So, Three ester bonds will link the three fatty acids to the one molecule of glycerol. We can build a fat from a variety of different types of fatty acids. Some of those fatty acids will be saturated, some will be unsaturated. And the key difference between saturated and unsaturated fatty acids is the presence of a carbon carbon double bond. Saturated fatty acids do not possess a carbon carbon double bond all of the carbon atoms are completely saturated with hydrogen atoms. In contrast, unsaturated fats have at least one carbon-carbon double bond. A monounsaturated fat has one carbon-carbon double bond. A polyunsaturated fat has more than one carbon-carbon double bond. So if we look at a picture like this, we can see this, this fat is going to be synthesized uh, following three individual dehydration reactions, forming three individual ester linkages. So this fat, or triglyceride, consists of one, two saturated fatty acid chains and one unsaturated fatty acid chain. We're going to classify this fat as unsaturated because it has at least one fatty acid chain with at least one carbon-carbon double bond. But please note that the fatty acids that make up fats, that make up triglycerides, can be very different. The carbon chain link can be different, as can the presence or absence of carbon-carbon double bonds. So why do we care about uh, saturated fats and unsaturated fats, and the presence or absence of these carbon-carbon double bonds? Well, it turns out that when you look at the structure of these molecules, and we'll spend some time in class looking at the structure of fatty acids and triglycerides on the computer, that the saturated fatty acids have a linear structure. All of those carbon atoms are lined up in what approximates a pretty close to a straight line. But in contrast, the unsaturated fats, because of the carbon-carbon double bond, have bends or kinks in the shape of the molecule. 
This becomes really important because these bends or kinks in the molecule prevent the fatty acid molecules from stacking tightly together. They really don't interact as well as the saturated fatty acids do. So while saturated fatty acids and saturated fats can stack tightly together, unsaturated fats can't. Why do we care? Well, saturated fats will tend to, will tend to be solids at room temperature because of that ability to stack tightly, while well, unsaturated fats are going to be liquids at room temperature because those kinks prevent the molecules from packing tightly together. So again, why do we care? Well, vegetable oils are exclusively composed of unsaturated fats. How do we know? Because they're oils at room temperature, and consequently, they must consist of unsaturated fats. Bacon fat, grease, butter, lard, those have to be saturated fats. How do we know? Well, they're solids at room temperature, which means the structure of the molecules are contributing to, in this case, the physical property of the molecule. The physical property being the melting point at which the fat transitions from a solid state to a liquid state. Unsaturated fats have much lower melting points than do saturated fats. And we can see this on this screen as well. Here are the kinks that I was referring to in unsaturated fats. Here's the linear nature of the saturated fats that uh, allow for close packing in saturated fats, but uh, the, kink, the kinks prevent the close packing in, un in unsaturated fats. All right, one more piece to add to the puzzle. When you have an unsaturated fatty acid, as we've seen, it is possible for the orientation of the carbon-carbon uh, double bond to be different. So we've seen that in a cis configuration, we can look at this in two different ways, either the hydrogen atoms or the rest of the molecule are on the same side as the carbon-carbon double bond. In contrast, in a trans configuration, we can see the carbon-carbon double bond but this time, whether we look at the hydrogen atoms or the rest of the molecule that's held together by that carbon-carbon double bond, the shape of the molecule is very different. Here's the bent, or kink, in the unsaturated fat that we would expect to see. But in a trans-unsaturated fat, and again, it's unsaturated because of that carbon-carbon double bond, this molecule is linear. It looks a lot more like a saturated fat. So, in general, trans fats are going to behave a lot more like saturated fats, while cis unsaturated fats will, will exhibit the, the typical properties of an unsaturated fat. Well, again, I ask you, why do we care? We care because many of the fats that you might consume in your diet every single day are, are generated from unsaturated fatty acids. So we can see here we're dealing with a cis unsaturated fatty acid. This might be a vegetable oil from a soybean plant, from corn, from safflower or sunflower. But many of these fatty acids are going to be converted into saturated fatty acids through this process known as hydrogenation. In essence, the way that that works is the unsaturated fatty acids are exposed to a high pressure hydrogen gas so as to break that carbon-carbon double bond and add hydrogen atoms across the carbon-carbon double bond thus saturating those carbon atoms with hydrogen atoms. The, product, the, the problem with this is that during that chemical process, sometimes these unsaturated cis fatty acids are inadvertently converted into trans uh, unsaturated fatty acids. And because those trans unsaturated fatty acids tend to behave as saturated fats within a living organism, we, we've created a system whereby we're taking unsaturated fatty acids and converting them into fatty acids that have more saturated properties. Well, again, the reason why we care about this is because many of these trans fats are hidden in your diet and you don't even know it. The Food and Drug Administration allows food manufacturers to take their food labels and in the case of measurements, if there is less than half of a gram of a substance, uh, per serving, uh, the food manufacturer is allowed to round down. So while you may look at a food label and see zero grams of trans fat, there's a good chance that that particular food product has some modicum of, of trans fat in it, but the food manufacturer has been allowed to, uh, to round down. So how do you know whether or not the foods that you eat have hidden, hidden amounts of trans fat and thus hidden amounts 
of saturated fats. Well, what you want to look for in the food label are the terms partially hydrogenated. Because again, as we saw in the previous slide, this hydrogenation step starts with unsaturated fatty acids, applies hydrogen in the form of a high pressure hydrogen gas, converts many of those unsaturated fatty acids into saturated fatty acids, but converts some of them into trans unsaturated fatty acids as well. So if you see these words on a food label, even if the food label says that the, that, that food product contains less, or sorry, contains zero grams of trans fat, there's a really good chance that that particular food product has some amount of trans fat. And that's why we say that there is always going to be a hidden amount of trans fat in the food that you eat, especially if it's a processed food. So that's what I'd like you to know about fats. We'll explore fatty acid structure more in class next week. I hope this video serves as a good introduction to what you're going to see um, later on in the week.